I've just been informed that our votes of Sweden just had been counted, so we are now going live to Stockholm. Hello, Blahi. Hello, hi. Hello, hi. Can you hear us? Hello, hi. We think you might be muted over there. Hello, hi. Okay, hi, there seems to be a connection issue. Uh, we're just leaving you for now. We'll come back to you later. Our last speaker of the day is native to the Fosdem country and will be joining us live from Hale in Belgium, where she works. Give a round of applause to, well, me. Hi and welcome to the State of Go, traditionally the last talk of the Go Dev Room and this year is still the same. In this talk we're going to look at what has been happening in the past six months in Go and also we'll be looking forward to the new Go 118 release which is about to be released any moment now. So we'll be talking today about what's new to the language, what's new in the standard library, what's new in tooling, we'll also be looking at some Go design drafts and at the end we'll be looking at look at the state of the community. So what's new since Go 116? Well, Go 117, which was released in August of 2021, and Go 118, which is expected to be released in February of 2022, and at the time of recording is in beta. First, we're going to look at changes to the language. There have been a few minor tweaks to the language this edition, but there is one which I want to talk about to you today. Go 118 finally has generics. So generics in Go follow the type parameter proposal and they do not break the Go 1.0 compatibility promise, meaning that all your existing Go code will still work in Go 118 with generics. The Go team encourages you to use generics inside your Go code, but warns you against using it in production code since it is not as well tested as some other parts of Go. So what are generics exactly? Well, we have here a typical CRUD interface, which you all have been written before in your life probably many times. So you have a create for a specific data model, you have a read from an ID to a data model, and a delete, a list, and an update, all the usual things you have in your application. Okay, but this only works for the specific model which is here targeted. This doesn't work for anything. With generics, we can now make this able to work for any possible data type. By just using square brackets, we can now define parameters for data types. So I define type T here, which can be anything. So I can re read anything, create anything, and I can also use these types in combinations with, for example, making it a slice of that type. This allows us to have a generic interface for all our CRUD actions in our database. So when we're looking at a practical example, I have a struct book, which I want to store in my bookstore. So I'm just going to create our CRUD interface with the type book, which then makes our whole interface compatible with the book type instead of the generic type T. 
So where can we use these generics? Well, you can use these in function declarations as well as type declarations. You can do them using the square brackets to have type parameters. We also now have a new alias for the MT interface. You can now just write the simple English word any. We also have a new identifier called comparable. Comparable allows you to compare, well, anything. So any data type that is comparable using equal or not equal can now be used in the comparable data type. So there is also this tilde, which we see in many places in examples and documentation. What is this tilde doing? Well, the tilde accepts any type with this as an underlying data type. So let's see, I'm writing a log4g logger, which I want to log anything that is related to the string. So anything with a string as an underlying data type. I can still log my normal everyday string, hello fosdem. But I can also start logging my own custom string, which I just created. As long as that string has the underlying data type, I can do anything to my special string and still use it in my logging function. So why would you use generics? Well, all magic about generics is done on compile time. So anything about logic, about using, for example, reflect, you no longer need to do that while in the runtime. This makes your program go faster. It also allows you to write things which you just simply could not write before in Go. So now might be the time to look into so you do your code and deduplicate some parts of your code. And maybe it also makes functional programming more feasible. Watch out for takes on that. But wait, generics is quite limited, especially in 118. So currently we have a few limitations in generics in Go. You cannot use type declarations inside generic functions. Type parameters do not work with unnamed fields, and you can only have one blank type declaration. What? Wait, even more? Well, generics causes more complexity. This is at different levels. The first one is internal complexity. It is now harder to implement the Go language. Well, you don't care because you're not a Go team, you don't implement Go yourself. But we see already results of this. The compiler today is 15% slower than it used to be in the previous release just because of generics. There is also some new complexity presented to the end user. It might be hard to explain how generics exactly work underneath. There is also a harder learning curve towards the proper use of generics inside your code. However, Go adopts a limited approach comparing to some other languages which also have generics. This makes this complexity both internally and externally less of a thing. But Watch out for hot takes by this guy, who really helped me understand generics for my slides. Up next, we're gonna talk about changes to the Go tooling. Let's take a look at some compiler improvements in Go 117. The compiler will now pass any function arguments and results using registers instead of using the stack. This gives us around a 5% performance increase. The Go compiler also now produces binaries, which are around 2% smaller. We took this test up on ourselves, and we compiled the kubelets and Ugo using Go 116 and the latest beta of Go 118. We saw 3% improvement in the Ugo binary, which is now smaller, and even 7% for the kubelet. Next up are new warnings to Go vet. These can be important to you because they might break your tests. There are two new warnings in Go 117. The first one is that it will now warn you when your Go build line and your old plus build line arguments are no longer matching. Last year we talked about the confusion with those two costs, and if you now have a line which is mismatching the new and the old syntax, well, you will get, finally get an error for that. We also have one new warning, which is when you use signal notify on an unbuffered channel for OS signals, because this can go wrong Quite badly, GoVet will now warn you uh, against doing that. In Go118, we also see a big change in Go modules. We now have workspaces. Workspaces are in the form of a go.work file. This file allows you to locally overwrite any Go modules. It is ideal for experimentation. So let's go take a look at it. Here, I have a demo project open, which is about FOSDEM. In this example, we're using an external library to count votes of our conference. 
This is imported using a Go module. Now, when we run this, we see that it has a bias against the United Kingdom. We want to go fix this. So what we do is we run Go work in it, which creates a new Go module workspace. So we want to replace this external module. So we will need a local copy of it. So we clearly do a git clone. And now we have the local module. We then, we then replace it in our Go workspace. Our Go workspace will look inside this folder, which we just specified, and we'll see that there is a go.mod file with that specific module name. Now we can go ahead and dependency, and we remove the check for the United Kingdom. When we now run it again, we notice that it uses our own copy as the United Kingdom now gets votes. And there are even some more changes to Go modules in Go 118. Go get no longer builds or install packages. It's now is solely used for updating your Go modules file. There is also a new flag to Go mod vendor, which is minus O. This is used to exporting your vendors to a specific pod which is very handy for third-party utilities to analyze all your Go dependencies. What's also new is in Go 118 is that it now has support for native fuzzing. So testing.f joins testing.b for benchmarks and testing.t for unit tests. Fuzzing will feed random data into your code, making sure your code is more secure against malicious user input, but also making it more resilient, catching any errors which you may not have thought of. If this sounds interesting to you, I really recommend you go to go.dev slash docs slash fuzz to learn everything about this. What's also new in Go118 is that we now have build info. Build info is now embedded into every binary which you build. You can also disable this. You can fetch this build info using the go version minus m commands, but also in the runtime using runtime debug. You can get build info such as the part of your module, your build options, but also your version of your version control. And the same is true for all the dependencies you will get inside your binary. You can get information about every single one of these. There is also a big improvement to GoFund. GoFund now runs concurrent, which we Govers love doing. This makes it way faster on a multi CPU system. So I did a test on my laptop and I ran a GoFund of the Kubernetes project, which is a huge pile of Go files. And when I do this in Go 116, it formats all of Kubernetes in around 17 seconds. When I now do this in Go 118, I get the same result in only 7.3 seconds. Up next, we're going to talk about changes to the standard library, starting with strings and bytes. So in string and bytes, the title function is now deprecated. This already dealt with Unicode incorrectly, so you shouldn't have been using this title. It's now officially deprecated. The trim function is now also allocation free, making it faster and use less memory. There is also a new cut function, which allows you to cut a string or a slice of bytes in two parts by finding a separator. This was previously done by combining several functions of the package. There is also a new addition to Go templating. In HTML and in text templates, ranges can now have breaks and continues, just like you would do in for loops in Go. This will probably make all of you YAML templaters out there quite happy that you can now use continue and break in all your ranges. Well, there are also some breaking changes in the standard library this edition. So if you had been sleeping during my talk, now would be the time to wake up. The first one is in URL parsing. So the URL query parser now no longer sees the semicolon as a separator. This was simply incorrect behavior according to the standard. So whereas you had previously a query string, which could be A is one, semicolon B is two, ampersand C is three, it will parse it nicely as A is one, B is two, C is three. 
but that's incorrect behavior. So now it will parse them as CS3. The first argument is just skipped, because the semicolon is a reserved character and should be encoded. So the first input was invalid. This is quite recently to see now, because there's just been a new study published which looks at URL parses in almost every language. And spoiler alert, they're almost always wrong. So it will be quite interesting if we see any changes in the next versions of Go inside the query parser to fix for these. If this sounds interesting, I put the link in my slides where you can read the whole paper. Talking about security, there are also some changes to TLS. Your TLS code will now no longer look at the order of the cipher suites. Crypto.tls will now decide for you, based on speed and security, which ciphers to prefer. Go 1.17 also now marks 3DES as insecure, but it's still there, so it can be used as a last resort cipher if your system doesn't support anything else. Go 1.18 will also disable version 1.0 and 1.1 of TLS by default, making only version 1.1, uh, sorry, 1.2 and 1.3 available. If you still need to deal with legacy systems, you can still enable them by setting a flag. There also is one new package in the standard library this year, which is Net NetIP. Net, uh, NetIP offers NetIP Adder, which is a new way to define an IP address in Go. It also adds Adder port, which is an address and a port pair, and a prefix to define a network IP prefix. So we already had net.ip before. How does this one differ? Well, this one is more efficient. It takes less memory, but it's also immutable. So it would be nice to use this one to pass IP addresses around in your code since they cannot be mutated. Because it's immutable, it's also comparable. So you can now easily compare two IP addresses using equal signs. And you can also use this new IP address as a map key. Now we're gonna take a look at changes to the Go runtime, more specifically, stack tracing and the Go garbage collector. Let's start with stack traces. Both Go 117 and 118 add new features to this. Go 117 improves the formatting of function arguments when printed in a stack trace. It now adds curly brackets around the address and a length pair, so it's easy to understand them in of the previous input where they were just mixed together. Go 118 adds on top of that also a question mark when the Go runtime is unsure where the address or the length is actually correct. In my example, you see this below, the variable is not length zero. There was also some improvements to a Go garbage collector. It now also looks at non-heap resources to determine when and how much to run. Well, this makes the garbage collector just way more predictable. However, it spends more time running garbage collection, but that results in less memory being used. If your program is not happy with that, you can still tune it using the usual ways. Go runs in many places on different platforms. Let's take a look at changes to them in Go ports. Go 117 now requires macOS 10.13 or later. Go 1.17 also added ARM64 support to the Windows platform. Go 118 will require iOS 12 or later for the iOS platform and will be the last to support FreeBSD 11. There is also some big changes to the AMD 64 platform. Go now supports four architecture levels, just like it did with ARM. You can change these using Go AMD 64, an environment variable, just like you did with Go ARM. There are four different kinds of levels. The first one is V1, which supports all 64-bit x86 processors. V2 will require features such as SSE3, SSE3, SSE2, and V3 will require features such as AVX, AVX2, BMI, etc. V4 will require AVX512 features, but that's just confusing for anyone. So let's look at probably less correct but more understandable relations. So I put this table together and V1 is indeed all 64-bit x86 processors. V2 is Intel processors produced after the architecture of 2008 or 2004 for AMD chips. It also still supports CPU emulation. 
uh, if you use the Intel platform, which is quite frankly cheaper, but also more memory, uh, sorry, power efficient, it only supports 2013 platforms and up. For V3, you have to have an Intel processor made after 2013 or an AMD processor made after 2015. For the Intel Intel platform, that's 2021. For V4, you will require a Skylake or 2015 Intel CPU or the latest generation AMD processor. If you have an Intel Atom, you're out of luck because they are not yet compatible. So why should you care about these new architecture levels? Well, it allows you to have more hardware optimizations using these better, newer and faster instruction sets. The real world impact of this, however, is quite minimal. Expect when you have code optimized for this. I did a test myself on my own laptop, an 11th gen Intel i7 processor. I did a test between V1 and V4, and I only saw a performance difference when it came to maps, where V4 was 3% faster. However, the Go team seems to claim that it can be in some places up to 20%. Up next, we're going to take a look at the future of Go. If you had been following the state of Go for a while, you would notice that everything which we talked about last year is now just implemented this year. So I think we're quite well at predicting the future of Go. We only have one design draft left, however, which we didn't discuss yet. So let's take a look at the Go vulnerability database. The Go vulnerability database, as its name may suggest, is a database of all vulnerable Go modules, Go programs, and their reports. It's available as JSON data, so you can use it in any security tooling which you may like, and maybe soon in any native tooling. Currently, at this time, there are no longer any new vulnerability reports accepted. However, we did saw some re recent progress in setting up a system for new reports. For the last topic of the day, we're going to take a look at my favorite subject, the community. The Go community, even though it's a pandemic, is still going strong. Let's take a look at the map of all Go meetups in the world. The map still looks quite the same as last year. But when we look at the numbers, we see a small growth. We now have 119,000 members in the Go community. That's 8,000 more than last year. We now have 196 meetups, which is six more than last year. But we are still only in 52 countries. Despite the pandemic, it's nice to see some growth still in the community. But it's way less than we used to see all of these years before. The same situation is in the Women Who Go and Go Bridge meetups, which still has only 41 chapters. At the end, let's talk about our own community, the FOSDEM community. We started here with the Go Dev Room in 2014, back when Go was way smaller. And we didn't skip a year. We went from small room to a small room to bigger room to same room to same room again to bigger room to way bigger room. But that was like a few weeks before the pandemic hit, so maybe that was not the best idea ever. Last year, we had our first online edition, which we all did our best to give our talks to you online, just like we did this year. This year, with Gophers around the world, we wanted to bring you a view into where Gophers are everywhere in this world without having to leave your home, without having, having to leave their home to, to Brussels. It was a really unique view to see where all Gophers are residing without having to suffer the cold Brussels February weather. So this year, we came to you from multiple places. I myself am just at my work here. Hill. And now let's take a look at the conferences for the next months. Well, the Go Dev Room at Fossum 2022, which is where you are now. Unfortunately, it has just ended, so you might want to rewatch them on YouTube later. The next Go conference is Com42 Go, which is being held on March 31st online. The next conference which, we, which I found is Govocom Brazil, which is still held in person, according to plan, in September of this year. Usually my slide of conferences is really full, but this year it was really hard for me to find any conferences to put on there. So please stay safe. And that also concludes FOSDEM 2022. 
I would like to thank out of my heart all speakers who did their best to appear online today. I also want to thank all our volunteers who made this day possible. And I also want to thank the Fosdem organization for setting up this whole online platform again for yet another year. I also want to see you all again next year, hopefully in Brussels. And for those talk contests which you had been voting for before, well, you can vote all you want. I really think everyone deserves. Tous moi pour tout le monde. Thank you.